College basketball is over, but spring sports are on the rise here on campus. We give you a fresh take of all Trojan athletics. From top rankings to heightened expectations, the Trojans are making a championship push. Let's get this winning party started. Sports scene is on in Studio C in the Julie Chen, Leslie Moonves, and CBS Media Center. It's going down for real this week as the Trojan schedule is jam-packed with action. Well, everyone, the wait is over. Football is back for one day only. The spring game is Saturday, and it is the first chance to see how some of the new Trojans look. Isaac Whitney and Ricky Town are among the new spring additions to the team that will be taking the field as Trojans for the first time. And the game is also a chance to see how the Trojan offense and defense will look without NFL hopefuls Leonard Williams, Nelson Aguilar, and Buck Allen. And the spring game starts at 3 at the Coliseum. This is the only chance to see the Trojans in a game setting until September. And now to give us an inside look on how the spring game could play out and who to keep an eye on, we welcome Jacob Freeman and Jeremy Bergman. Guys, thanks for joining us. So Jacob, first question I have, biggest position battle that you've seen so far and how it will play out in the spring game? For me, the biggest position battle has to be who's going to be the second receiver next to Juju Smith. So USC actually has a lot of guys that are fighting for that number two spot. There's Steven Mitchell, there's a Jen A. Harris, there's Isaac Whitney, there's Darius Rogers. And so far, it looks like Steven Mitchell has really gotten the most time playing the second reps. He had a lot. Of, he had a couple touchdown catches yesterday in 11 and 11 scrimmage. So he's looked really well, but he might be more of a slot guy. In it. So it'll be interesting to see who's going to get the bulk of the the targets besides Juju Smith in the spring game for that. For me, it's tight end. There are only two tight ends on USC's uh, staff right now, Jalen Kofitzpatrick and Connor Spears. They have combined for only three receptions in a USC uniform, and those are all from Kofitzpatrick. Uh, USC will be getting two other tight ends, Tyler Petit and Taylor McNamara, in the fall. So in the spring game, it'll be interesting to see if Kofitzpatrick or Spears can get ahead uh, before the other two come in. Spears has a lot of hype coming out of Columbia as a transfer, but of course that's an Ivy League school, different competition when you're playing against a Pac-12 team. So then, which of these new guys are you looking forward to see? There's five spring admits. Which one are you looking most forward to seeing in the game? Uh, I'd say Isaac Whitney. Uh, he, he is in competition for the second spot uh, for wide receiver. Uh, he's a tall guy. He's built to be the second wide receiver, a deep threat, but he's not as bulky. Uh, he's impressed a little bit so far, but it'll be interesting to see in a competitive game situation if he can match up against the cornerbacks like Adore Jackson. For me, it's the linebacker out of Utah, Cameron Smith. So Sua Cravens, who could be USC's best defensive player this year with Leonard Williams gone, actually spoke out and praised Smith on how he is one of the most ready linebackers to enter USC in a long time. And as you know, the Trojans have had a huge tradition of bringing in blue chip linebackers. So the fact that Sua Cravens, who is probably the USC's defensive captain this year, is praising Smith really speaks to that. He could get a lot of time as a freshman. And I'm interested to see how Ricky Town actually comes in as could be the quarterback of the future. Obviously, Cody, Cody Kessler's here now, but it could be a couple years down the line just to see him for the first time as a Trojan, uh, see what he can do. And then how does the team look this spring compared to last spring? Last spring was Sark's first spring with the team. Now he's had that year under his belt. What looks different, Jacob? Well, I think what's really been standing out to me so far has been that USC is really slinging it down the field. You remember under Lane Kiffin, fans cheered when there was a pass in a game where they threw it downfield. It wasn't even completion, but they cheered. And come, going to practice the last couple of weeks, USC, not only Cody Kessler, but also back to quarterback Max Brown, has really been slinging the ball downfield to Juju Smith, to a Jenna Harris, to Stephen Mitchell, and as well as to cornerback Dory Jackson. So I'm also looking forward to seeing is Jackson going to play offense or defense in the spring game? He played cornerback as a freshman, but he played wide receiver in Tuesday's practice, and he looked like he was ready to go out there and catch anything and everything from Kessler and Brown. So this is, they call it the spring game, but it's more of a glorified scrimmage. What are your expectations for it? Well, USC has a lot of injuries right now, especially on defense. Antoine Woods, who hasn't played in a while, we'd really like to see him play, but he's not going to be able to. Uh, the expectations is just to see a lot of deep balls, uh, have a, you know, Show, show a good show for the, for the fans. Uh, I really want to see how Max Brown performs. We all know Cody Kessler is the Heisman candidate going into the season, but Max Brown is probably going to be you know, the future of the USC Trojans. So if he can get a leg up on Ricky Town, who this is going to be his first experience as a USC quarterback, if he can show that he matured from the last two years where he's kind of struggled in practice and game situations, I think that could be huge for him. What I want to see is the mobility from Cody Kessler. So Cody Kessler 
got sacked a lot last year, and for all his fault, he's really been trying to fix that. So he's been mentioning all practice, all spring, that he really wants to avoid the 25, 30 sacks that he had last year. So right now, the word he's been using is escapability. So it'll be interesting to see, and it won't be a full speed practice. Guys aren't going to be, they're not, the quarterbacks aren't going to be tackled. It's going to be pretty light. But it'll be interesting to see how Kessler does just getting out of the pocket and finding it downfield. He's not the kind of guy that's going to be a Michael Vick and make plays with his feet, but if he can show that he's much improved from last year, that'll be a really big sign for USC. Well, thank you guys for joining us and enjoy the game on Saturday. And now we send it over to Evan with a special guest. So to join us here with a little in-depth discussion about the spring game, we're joined by Gary Paskowitz, publisher at WeRSC.com. Thanks for joining us, Gary. Uh, glad to be here, Evan. Thanks for having me. So I want to start first with the wide receiver position. We know Juju Smith had a great year last year, but some new names coming to the table, especially a guy like Stephen Mitchell. What have you seen from him in spring practice? I think Stephen Mitchell is who you have to start with if you're talking the receiver spot. Um, so dynamic and explosive. And that's really what we hoped he was going to be when he came out of Alamany, got hurt before his freshman year. And it's kind of taken a while to get back to close to 100%. But I think what you're starting to see is the formation of a duo with him and Juju. And when you look back to when Sark was here before, you had Mike Williams, Kerry Colbert, Dwayne Jarrett, Steve Smith. And you're kind of seeing the development of that again. And that could be real big for Trojan fans if that happens. So in the spring game, it's a little different than a typical game, right? you got 100 plays, a little more of a pace to it. Who are some players you're looking for in this Saturday's contest? Uh, I, I think the two we just mentioned, you're going to see some Juju Smith. You're going to see some Steven Mitchell. I also think how much are we going to see of Adoree on the offensive side of the ball? Sarkeesian said yesterday, I know what the fans want to see. They want to see him with the ball in his hands. And so I think we will see that. But I think at the quarterback spot, we know we're going to have Cody Kessler. But how much do we see Max Brown? Because that's one guy who, you know, Cody gets so much attention. But Max has steadily been being a terrific player in practice. And so we'll see him. And then on defense, I think people are going to really like what they see particularly from the secondary much improved from last year so that position group in general you see Sua move to linebacker but a, a fresh face is at safety what's been impressive about you with those new guys looking there I would say John Plattenberg first I think he's the guy as a true sophomore has really kind of taken a leadership role and then they move Chris Hawkins back from corner and you've had a real good competition between Leon McQuay who does look better and then Hawkins has been pretty physical so I think that little three-man rotation right there in the safety has probably been position wise the biggest surprise of spring so we talk about the leaders lost the, the Hayes Plards of the world, the, Nel the Nelson Aguilars, the, the Leonard Williams. What do you think about some of the new leaders? We can look at Sua Cravens, Cody Kessler, developing as maybe more captains or just leadership guys in this team. I think Sua is definitely a guy you start with. I thought he was the most solid player on defense this spring. Finally seeing that adjustment being made to linebackers. When you think about it, he was moved to linebacker from safety right when the season was starting. So there wasn't a lot of practice time to get adjusted. Now he looks so much more comfortable in that role, getting into the backfield and making plays. And he said it with a big smile on his face, I finally get this position now because I'm close to the line and I like making plays and that's what I could do. So I really like that. And then you talk about right next to him with Hayes Pillard being gone, seeing what Lamar Dawson has done to be that senior leader, that's been really impressive. Yeah, Trojan fans forget he started his first two years, gets hurt, now comes back. I am curious, though, from your perspective, looking at Sark in year two versus Sark in year one, you mentioned that players are more comfortable. They understand what the system's like. What does that mean when you have a full year under Sark as opposed to just coming in the first time in January? I think as much as anything for the players, it means you're not thinking as much about the transition, about the changes in the playbook. And once you're more comfortable with everything, it allows you to play faster. And I think that's one thing we've seen, Evan, this spring. Things look crisper in, in the practices. They just they look like everything is flowing more naturally, particularly on offense. This offense is going to be a big step up from last year. And when you look at what they accomplished with such a young offensive line, the numbers they put up, the fact that things could be better is very exciting. So with that group, we know Cody Kessler returns, had a great season, not making turnovers last year to, right. a, to a good degree. Coming into this season, I know fans have big expectations for him. What should people real honestly expect from Kessler and company? Uh, I, I think when you talk about a fifth-year senior quarterback, I think that's su such a big thing when you look at the history of the conference and how many teams are winning it with that veteran quarterback. That, that's, in, that's really exciting when you think of what Cody can be. He looks so comfortable out there right now. He threw the deep ball yesterday more than we have seen before. That's not I don't think that would call that his strength. <laughs> but he's more of a game manager. When you look at all the weapons that he's going to have around him, I think just making good decisions and getting rid of the ball. And Sark says he wants to just trust his instincts a little more. When you see See something right away, go ahead and trust that it's there and make the play. So I know you you were a fan of, of Coach Hubs and company with the baseball squad. Right. You, you and Dan go back in college. Seeing what you've seen from that team this year, the top 10 squad now, what, what, what do you think about the baseball squad and just their development this year? Uh, I, I love the fact that it looks like they're playing Trojan baseball. You know, there's a little spirit to them. There's some hustle. What I love as much as anything, though, Evan, is pitching. 
I think that's a big thing in college baseball right now, and that's Dan's specialty. But when you have good pitching, you can go a long way in this sport. And they go several guys deep at that spot. So I'm excited about what this future holds for this team. Yeah, and plenty of excitement on the football squad, too. That, that all gets set on Saturday for the big spring game. Gary, we want to thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Hey, everyone. Coming to you live from the Sports Pod and the Annenberg Media Center. Ever wonder what a USC player thinks when he's not playing football? Our Beverly fam took some eccentric questions from some USC students and put the men of Troy to the test. What do you guys do after the football game? Um, <laughs> after football games, I either go to, to King Taco or La Australia. Um, it's one of my favorite food places out in Pasadena, Old Town. Spend time with my family, eat a lot of Samoan food, and then go home and see what's going up tonight, or that night. <laughs> you think this is the year? I do think this is the year. I mean, I've, I've thought every year was the year, to be honest, but this year I've really seen an improvement in the team and how we're practicing, so yeah, I actually do. Oh yeah, this is the year. You know, on the offensive side as well, we're great. On defense side, we're working, we're working on it, and we're gonna have a lot of fun. I'd ask the rest of the offense if they think uh, Cody can lead us to a national championship. Yes, he can. Cody has all the talent in the world, and I, I definitely think he can lead us. He's been a great leader. Last year, he broke a he broke multiple records, so and I'm, I'm, I have no doubt in him that he'll do the same this year. I would ask them what their favorite thing to do in an aquarium is. An aquarium? I don't know, that's a good one. Go see the dolphins, I think, or the whales, one of those. I don't know. If you could be a fish, what would you be? Um, a jellyfish. <laughs> Killer whale, they're one of the smartest, and they eat, well, they, they go against great white sharks and they beat them, so, killer whale. What song gets you really pumped up? Taylor Swift, Shake It Off. I'm kind of different from everybody else, you know, when, when we're all getting ready for the games, everybody's listening to, you know, like these pump up songs. I just, I like to listen to relaxing songs. How many times have you changed your hair color? About two times, maybe going on three, maybe four, maybe nine, I don't know, we'll see. Nine. I see what you did there. You can catch Juju Smith and his jellyfish at the Coliseum this Saturday at 3 p.m. for the annual USC Spring Game. For more tidbits on USC Spring Athletics, let's send it over to Evan. We have a 12-pack of sports to crack open this weekend in a loaded time of the year for USC sports. We start by laying out the Trojan dominance in non-revenue sports. USC has three teams ranked number one in the country right now, and things have only gotten better after the Trojans finished a perfect 9-0 over the Easter weekend. Let's take a look at some of the best teams out there right now in the non-revenue programs. Besides those top three ranked squads, women's water polo is knocking on the door at number three overall, and the defending national champion men's tennis team is creeping closer to a top five ranking. Also note that USC baseball, they're at their highest ranking since 2003. So back at it now, let's focus on the top ranked sand volleyball team for a second. The women of Troy are now 15-0 and, and prepare for a doubleheader on Thursday. We're going to play LMU as we've been playing them. Uh, we've been doing really well against them, so um, we're going to probably stay with the game plan on them. And as far as San Francisco, we haven't played them yet, so we're going to go in with an open mindset and try things out and see how those go. Following those two matches, the women of Troy head down to Hermosa Beach for the Collegiate Challenge on Saturday and Sunday over on the beach. And now we kick it to the indoor volleyball team where they beat Concordia last night. So it was huge to be able to get these guys on the court and get a win and, and, and again and get some guys some rest. So now we have the guys have two days off and so uh, and then we get back to practice Friday. We have alumni day Saturday off Sunday and then we get into our prep for the final two league matches, which if we can, you know, we control our own destiny. If we can win those two, then then we're going to be back here for an MPSF playoff match. And for the men's tennis squad, Peter Smith's fifth-ranked club heads up north this weekend, looking to keep alive a perfect mark in Pac-12 play. We just go out there and compete every time, so I don't think that's too big of a factor. But if they have a big crowd and stuff, that's always, you know, in their favor. But I think, you know, we're just going to do our, worry about ourselves. USC is led by five players with 20-plus wins in singles court this year, led by number six Yannick Hoffman and 19th-ranked Roberto Quiroz. These two also team up for the fifth-ranked doubles tandem in the nation. Now let's toss it over to Richard Golander as the insight, knock on wood, on the major injuries in big sports. Thanks, Evan. Uh, today's sports injury update is about strain and sprain injuries. Superficial injuries to the musculoskeletal system, such as strains and sprains, are the most common sports injuries. We often hear or read about an athlete who has sustained a strain-sprain injury, where the words strain-sprain seem to be combined and used interchangeably. 
Well, strains and sprains are different injuries, but similar in that they both involve soft tissues of the musculoskeletal system. They are different in that strain injuries involve the more superficial structures, such as the muscles and tendons, whereas sprain injuries involve deeper tissues, such as the ligaments. To further discuss this, let's look at the shoulder anatomy. Looking at the shoulder, uh, the human shoulder, for example, we see superficial and deep muscles. All these muscles attach to bones across the joints via their tendons. Muscles and tendons function to mobilize bones across the joint's range of motion. The muscles and tendons are typically the structures which sustain strain injury. Here we see deeper into a human shoulder where we find ligaments. Unlike muscles and tendons which function to mobilize bones across joints, ligaments function to support, stabilize, and minimize movement of bones at the joint. Ligamentous sprains occur at this deeper level. Part of the reason we often hear the diagnosis strain-sprain injury used in combination is because sprain injuries of deeper ligamentous tissues tend to have simultaneous strain injuries of superficial muscles and tendons at the joint. Assuming all factors associated with the mechanism of injury are equal, the health implications are that superficial strain injuries to muscles and tendons are more easily rehabilitated than are deeper sprain injuries to ligaments. And this concludes today's sports injury update. Let's toss it back to Ken. Thanks, Richard. Many of the athletes at USC are on athletic scholarships, but some athletes received the Swim with Mike scholarship. Sports scene's Josh Cohen caught up with the recipient of the scholarship to find out more about it. Josh Cohen here for Sports Scene. I'm out here with Jack Jablonski, fellow freshman at USC. And we're talking about Swim with Mike today. Jack, what is Swim with Mike? Well, Josh, uh, Swim with Mike is a scholarship for, for athletes that have uh, faced disabilities, uh, not necessarily during athletics, but uh, for athletes who have participated in athletics. And for that, it's, uh, it's something that Swim With Mike, that's a USC-based scholarship, has given out to, uh, to people that have gone through that. Obviously an incredible opportunity, and what has it meant to you specifically in your time here? Well, getting the scholarship with Swim With Mike is, has been life-changing and, and being able to have an opportunity to go to USC. And although the scholarship uh, isn't just for USC kids, it, it goes around the country, uh, having the option to come here and, and being admitted here is, is something that uh, has you know, opened up plenty of doors. Absolutely. And you're a journalism student. You're in Annenberg. What's been the best part of your experience so far here as a freshman? I think being able to explore opportunities that uh, USC students are, you know, able to in the sense of, of being able to be a part of Annenberg and, and getting to know people that have the same, you know, qualities and, and interests that you do. Absolutely. Well, Jack, thank you very much for joining us here at Sports Scene. I'm Josh Cohen. Thank you, Josh. The annual Swim with Mike fundraising Swimathon takes place Saturday here at USC. Over $15 million have been raised since the scholarship was created in 1981, and there have been 178 recipients of the scholarship. Even though the men's and women's basketball championships are over, March Madness doesn't end until the sports scene trivia crack champion is announced. And a quick look at the bracket before we show you the highlights of the epic final game. Eight seed Evan has somehow survived two 6-5 duels to make it to the finals against three seed Alyssa, who has coasted to the final. And here's how the trivia crack tournament was won. It's the final question. This is like actually. It's the final. This is bullshit. Oh, hey. Evan. Oh. Language. Five, four, three. This is for the Trivia Crack Five. Championship. Whoa! What are you going to do with the trophy? I didn't realize there was a trophy. There's a trophy. What are you going to do with it? I'll just leave it here in the sports pod so it can, like, so Evan can see it every day. At the end of the day, probably the better player <laughs> that won. Uh, I just wish I had a chance. You know, one one shiny moment. Didn't get much of that today. The luck wasn't my way. You know, at the end, at the end of the day, it's about the team, and the team failed me today. We didn't Whoa, execute. Lisa! <laughs> Who said you won? <laughs> anyway, it, it just, you know. The team didn't play well. Give credit to Alyssa, she stepped up. I just couldn't win. So there you have it. Alyssa is the winner of the Trivia Crack Tournament. That will haunt you for the rest of your life. So close, but yet so far.
that's too bad. That's too bad. But that ends the Trivia Crack Tournament, and that's it for Sports Scene. Thank you for joining us. Remember, the spring game is Saturday at 3 o'clock. So just know it's not free for everyone, but the action is certainly more lively than sipping a cup of tea or picking up my tears after that loss. See ya.